in 2022, we actually had planned to go raise our Series A just on usage growth alone without even monetizing yet. And quickly the market changed and we're okay, well, that's off the table, right? We've now got to go get revenue. And so, um, so, you know, it, it did become challenging in the last two years while we kind of, kind of got stuck a little bit in no man's land for a while between, you know, one era and the other, right? Because the goalposts move, but uh, I only work well under pressure. Um, and so I'm always trying to construct things that force me to like survive or die sort of thing. And I always said like, well, you can't make it work in the next 12 months. So let's shut it down and go on the next thing. Right. Like, um, so yeah, it, it, very unique environment, right? Like in, in looking back on it now, I realize how crazy it was. And I think if I'd realized how crazy it was at the time, I probably would have added more zeros, but just to focus on building the business. I, I find fundraising to be this like distraction and it's just like a means to an end. Like, raise a little bit of money so I can get back to work. There are two types of AI entrepreneurs. One is building a business now, and one is selling the AGI dream of the future. In one corner, selling that AGI dream is open AI. Everyone's darling, burning through billions, pursuing the holy grail of artificial general intelligence. Their latest fundraising round of 6 billion was done because they were burning 5 billion a year, even while they're starting to make money. And their product is a promise that may or may not be real. And in the other corner is Fathom, a scrappy startup that's quietly leading the way that we take notes and handle meetings driven by AI. I'm Declan Dunn, and I help entrepreneurs, small businesses, and creators take advantage of AI before it takes advantage of them. And in episode 65, OpenAI burns 5 billion, Fathom gets 2 million in love, AI profits beyond hype. I'm showing a bias that I have towards entrepreneurs. And my interview included here with Richard White, the CEO of Fathom, goes into how he developed his product and raised funding for all the AI entrepreneurs listening. And his round of 17 million, his Series A, included 2 million coming from his customers with the same terms that the big venture capitalist got, preferred stock. Now, would OpenAI's customers invest in OpenAI stock? Maybe. Would they get the same terms as these multi-billion dollar crazy valuations? No way, obviously. So today, we're going to dissect these two approaches to AI development and fundraising. One is based on customers. The other is selling a dream of what might possibly come. That's where the big money comes. We'll explore how Fathom has grown steadily over four years, built on testing products and its own proprietary technology. That's how we think real AI businesses are built, not on promises and burn rates, and, and Fathom has had a burn rate, but on good products, customer love, and sustainable growth. But later on, we'll reveal why Fathom's model might just outlast the AGI race, because there's more there than seen at first glance. So time to look at AI's possible futures, and that destination might surprise you. We begin by comparing Fathom's development to OpenAI's product development. Fathom's rooted in a disciplined process, the other careening between dystopian dreams and the insanely deep pockets of the tech industry seeking AGI Uber Alice, trying to build moats, remember that. Here's what started product development at Fathom and how it grew over four years based on feedback and centered on the customers directly from Richard White, the CEO. Right before COVID, I was actually doing a lot of product research. And so that meant I was on a bunch of Zoom meetings. And like I was trying to talk to people and take notes at the same time. And I'm like hurry typing up notes. And then after the meeting, I'm like cleaning up those notes so that they make any sense. And I just felt like this is such a terrible process. There were some tools that were doing stuff like this or recording transcription, uh, but they're really focused on salespeople only. And they're really expensive. And we say, gosh, why are they so expensive? Well, because transcription is really expensive. And so we kind of this thesis that like, we think transcription is going to be, become really cheap. This is a product that people were charging $150 a month for, but we said, we're going to yeah. give it away for free um, because we think that cost curve will catch up. By the time we have enough usage, the cost curve will come down. And we think this thing will just spread like wildfire and then we'll drop in AI when it gets really good and it'll get even better. That was kind of the thesis. I like to think about metrics and I is... I like to think about metrics back to front. So I, th I always say, 
I want to solve mm-hmm. one key metric at a time in the business. I see a lot of people that like start nice. off and they're like, we're trying to monetize and we're trying to prove engagement and we're trying to fix our onboarding. I'm like, pick one, okay. right? In Fathom's case, it was like, we, we, I always start with free user retention first. I'm a big mm. fan of monetize. We did monetize for until we were two years in. Um, I'm a oh, big wow. fan of delayed monetization because I think it's hard enough to get people to use the thing, but then to get them also to pay for it, getting them to use it's hard enough barrier for most products, in my opinion. And I'm generally a, yeah. of the belief that if someone's using your product day in, day out, you'll eventually find a way to charge them or you'll charge people like them. So right. we focused on retention first and really f- figured out retention. Once we figure out retention in that beta period with those 50 users I mentioned, then great, we launched, we saw all those users, we saw that onboarding didn't work, and then we got really smart about, okay, let's make sure onboarding works really well. Great, now that onboarding works really well, let's focus on referral loops and like virality. Mm. Oh, wait, the market shifted, no one cares about growth. Put referral loops on the shelf and go focus on monetization. And so I think in all these cases, we then, there's a top level metric and we go build a dashboard of here's all the things that contribute into that metric. And every day, I think on the onboarding thing, I paired with one of our engineers and we spent three mm-hmm. months and every day we were just like, okay, let's look at the numbers today. What feels like the weakest spot we can push on? Oh, let's go get rid of that page. Let's go simplify this page. And I just, there was a, there was like a, you know, PRD probably notion page, like about five pages long at the end of it. Just here's all the bullet points of things we did every day. And so, and then yeah. check the numbers. So I think that approach to kind of like data driven things again you not most many most startups can't do it at an early stage which is why you've got to go with your gut but if you have enough data obviously it's a, <laughs> it's a way better way to adopt right sort of thing than trust and verify see now listening to that you might think richard just has a cute little ai note-taking service and that's what he focused on building his own proprietary technology and as he says in an interview with TechCrunch about the series a he goes Working with models is very different from typical engineering projects. His quote, their output is not a feature, it's actually spec. And it has a failure rate. It's not like engineering where you put something on the roadmap, it gets done. It's like 50% time right now. If it's not good enough, let's go check back in six months. I think it required rethinking the product development process a little bit and encouraged him to develop his own product his own technology. Now think about that when you think of ChatGPT, because the promises will all use their API, use their service, but some of these savvy people are finding out it's not good to play with them because they have the same 50% failure rate. Now what Fathom offers that's beyond what it's currently selling is a product that is targeted for possibly content moderation for social media platforms. Hey, if it can assemble meetings, notes, turn them into templates, It could sure look at what data comes from social media, especially driven by video. Video analytics for marketing and advertising. Automated highlight generation for sports and events. I mean, I can do a meeting and send my team to a specific part of the video and listen just to that. Just like you can do on YouTube when you click on different chapters. Video search and discovery for media companies. Now that $73 million valuation is built to generate a $17 million Series A. But the difference with Fathom is in four years, they've developed a product, a proprietary technology, and now it's time to scale and move into sales and growth. Will it work? They still have to face burn rates and still have to grow, but it's actually very comparable to what's happening at OpenAI, just at a different level. Now, what makes OpenAI so tricky is that we all love ChatGPT and we swear by it. But does that get in the way of all the PR and the hype that's thrown around because they have developed several key products. But what they've done is the same thing Fathom's done. It's called delayed monetization. Give it away for free initially, which they did up to about 2022 when it got really good, GPT-3. And then they released it and now charge $20 a month. And they assume they can increase that to 22 and to 44 down the road and that their subscriber base will continue to grow. Now, the key products here are ones you know. GPT, the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer Language Models, GPT-3 and then GPT-4, which comes out in ChatGPT, their chatbot, we all know, DALI, Whisper, an automatic speech recognition system, APIs that allow developers to access and build on OpenAI's models, 
and their primary revenue streams are supposed to come from that API access, but most of it, 2.7 billion of the three plus billion they make in 2024 estimated is gonna come from ChatGPT plus subscriptions at $20 a month. The enterprise has not moved as fast as they expected and they have a $157 billion valuation. It's sure not built on getting millions and tens of millions of subscribers at $20 a month. If it is, ask yourself, how true is that if you've used the other models that are very comparable, that pretty much do the same thing? I'm not saying they're all the same, but the differentiation is sort of small. And even like Fathom's AI note-taking service has a bunch of competitors who do the same thing, their growth is already cemented. Their loyalty, their customer love is there. It's there for ChatGPT, but will it last? And will they be able to take these crazy investments and actually achieve it? Because OpenAI has a really tough problem. They began in 2015 as this open source model, which was supposed to battle the control of AI by Google. It was done for humanity, for ethics, to give back, to make our lives better. Now, will that last when you have $157 billion valuation and it's getting hardcore? Do ethics really matter? That's a lot to ask for any company, but much less this one. That's why the product development that's happening at ChatGPT brings up a lot of alerts. I mean, if I was to tell you a business that is nine years old, has never been profitable, is burning $5 billion a year, even while making 3.7 billion, and those costs are only going up. Their entire talented founders and staff have gone, except for Sam Altman. Nobody wants to stay around. Everyone says it's great, but even their investors who put in over $18 billion are hedging other bets. This is a major gamble going on. I mean, Microsoft is not putting all its cards into OpenAI. And that's where the product line really needs to stand out. Will it become what Silicon Valley wants, which is a moat? Google search has been a moat for years, but is that a model from the back.com days that doesn't exist? Can AI really create moats? And if it is, what is OpenAI's AGI dream gonna do compared to Anthropics Claude, which is also a public benefit corporation? Mistral, maybe nothing, maybe something. XAI, six billion that Elon's got. There's a number of different AGIs coming out. Meta's gonna have one, Google has one. Anybody who has a social network is trying to create one. So you tell me, is there gonna be a moat around AGI? Because if there isn't, I can tell you I've left ChatGPT for Claude because Claude does a better job for me. I'm not throwing shade at them. I'm just saying, are you projecting these numbers out? Or are you following, like Richard White did at Fathom, testing it out and adapting? Or are you selling the dream and seeing if it'll work? But in the end, do customers love it? I will say a lot of customers love ChatGPT. But will that wilt? Will their performance come down? Can they stand out? And can they get that API money? Because without that, the differentiation is pretty much nothing, isn't it? It's not going to be little subscribers that build ChatGPT and OpenAI to this behemoth moat. It's probably going to be bigger companies' usage, and that's got to be the core of what that crazy $157 billion valuation comes from. Now it's time to talk about the investment path both of these companies have taken. And again, the micro level shows you a little bit about the macro. Because what Richard White did that was really brilliant, he started before AI was cool. In fact, his first investors were freaked out by him using the word AI. And then he went out and joined Y Combinator. He's gonna go on about that and share with how he raises money a little bit at a time in rounds so he could gradually grow the business. Obviously, he doesn't have the pressure that OpenAI has, but obviously he's also done something that they haven't done yet had this tremendous loyalty and love of his customers that are willing to invest their own money in his growth, and he's willing to treat them with the same level of respect. So take a listen to what Richard has to say and what his entrepreneur's journey was to all you AI startups. See how it's done from somebody who doesn't spend all his time fundraising because that is a distraction.
And but you're also in the middle of the crazy AI money of 2021 and 2022. Yeah. And the ZERP, you know, zero percent interest rates when mm -hmm. there was nowhere to put money. And coming back from my background and raising funds, I've known two types of entrepreneurs: those who want money to to actually build a company, and then those who raise, burn, raise more with huge valuations. And I was curious, like when you raised 4.7 million in January, 2022, was there that, um, how did you approach it? And was there that temptation in those early hot markets to almost start adding zeros to your valuation just because you can't? Um, I don't think through the first three years of the company, we ever had more than uh, like 12 months of runway. Like we actually, so, mm. you know, we announced we raised that much. We actually, before this most recent round, we raised, we had raised $10 million over three and a half years, but we basically raised it a million dollars at a time, like every six months or something. Um, nice. We were a pretty high burn startup. I remember, you know, I started with mm -hmm. five of my best engineers from my last company. And so I remember going through YC and like, we had a way higher, we had like a 150 burn and everyone else is burning like 15 gay. And I was like, what are you doing? It's like, well. I optimize for speed, not like we know there's a window we need to hit. So we're not optimized for dilution. We're optimized for speed in the market. When we started the company, I raised half a million dollars from friends and family. Got into YC, raised a million dollars. Demo day, raised 1.5. Six months later, raised another 1.5. Um, and part of maybe that confidence came from, you know, those first three, four rounds were in that era where it was objectively much easier to raise money at for seed stage kind of moonshots, right? Um, and frankly, in 2022, we actually had planned to go raise our Series A just on usage growth alone without even monetizing yet. And quickly, the market changed. And we're like, okay, well, that's off the table, right? We've now got to go get revenue. And so, um, so you know, it, it did become challenging in the last two years while we kind of, kind of got stuck a little bit in no man's land for a while between, you know, one era and the other, right? Because the goalpost moved. But uh, I only work well under pressure. Um, and so I'm always trying to construct things that force me to like survive or die sort of thing. And I always say like, well, if we can't make it work in the next 12 months, so let's shut it down and go on the next thing. Right. Like, um, so yeah, it, it, very unique environment, right? Like in, in looking back on it now, I realize how crazy it was. And I think if I'd realized how crazy it was at the time, I probably would have added more zeros, but just to focus on building the business. I, I find fundraising to be this like distraction and it's just like a means to an end. I'm raise a little bit of money so I can get back to work. Um, and, and, you know, and that's partially why we did, we never really did true fundraisers. We just did kind of party rounds. We probably had a hundred people on the cap table where we just mainly raised from angels and, uh, small institutions so that we could just raise small checks and just keep moving and not spend a month of my time heads down on fundraising. No, it makes so much sense. Oh my, I mean, it, it is so raising funds can literally become your full-time job. I've seen so many businesses actually lose it because the leadership is so focused on the next round and yep. <laughs> not the business. <laughs> right. But it was interesting as you went into Y Combinator, which obviously is really well known. And I know one of the early startups you work with, I think it was called Kiko, came from Y Combinator. How did your experience with Y Combinator shape the company's early development? And, and why did you choose to go with Y Combinator, which is a very different sort of a, approach to the day? Yeah, I had a really fun experience, like, gosh, probably 15 years earlier in my career where I joined a company, this was Kiko, that was in the first batch of Y Combinator. So I remember going to the Y Combinator office wow. in Cambridge and hanging out with Paul Graham and, and whatnot. Um and that was a really cool experience, right? It was kind of like my way into startups. And so then I think for 15 years, I, I felt like I was YC adjacent. I knew a lot of that community. It's a great community of builders. And so when I went to start Fathom, you know, I think most of, a lot of the folks that joined YC are much earlier in their career. And it makes sense because it's a great place to build network, right? To, you know, if you're coming right. out of college or you're in your 20s and whatnot and you want to get to startups, there's really no better place to, you know, find like-minded people that you can work with than that. But I already had that network. But what I looked at it and says, like, gosh, at this point in my career, all my friends are now like VCs or retired sort of thing, or they're running public companies. I think there's yeah. a lot to be said for getting advice from people that are also in the arena. One, if I got into, you know, YC, which I think is, you know, probably the most prestigious kind of seed funding thing, I'm going to be surrounded by other folks in the arena. I can learn from them. What are they using? What are the, what are the ways tactics you're using for sales, for engineering, for you name it? Um, and also, I just know I'm a very competitive person. 
And so I knew if I put myself in an environment surrounded by these people that are also doing really well, I will naturally like work a little bit harder because I want to be, yeah. I want to kind of like have that like subtle competition. We were, I think the second batch during COVID, so it was fully remote. Um, so very different vibe wow. from the, you know, what I, you know, 450 companies fully remote versus the first batch I was adjacent to where it was like eight companies in an office, right? In Cambridge sort of thing. So, um, but fantastic experience all around and makes it much easier than it is if you're on your own. So, you know, that alone kind of pays for the equity hit. But the equity hit is obvious up front, but there's also, I've known several people have been in Y Combinator and they echo what you're saying. It's such a different sort of community and yep. network. I don't even have words for it because it's very different than anything else. Certainly a unusual story and one of a product developer, keeping it small, growing the company and doing a very specific task. That's one of the challenges you'll see when compared to OpenAI, who's trying to do ChatGPT and Dolly and the API. They have many, they're, they're obviously looking to be the biggest thing. Richard also would like to be the biggest thing in AI note-taking, but obviously the investors seeing this go much further the growth is built on the use of video and his proprietary technology to do this. Now, if you look at their $73 million valuation, it's obviously that growth has got to come and that's what's being invested now in more engineering talent and in sales driven approach to be able to get more enterprise clients. And what's the albatross hanging over OpenAI's neck? To get an understanding of this in 2015, this dream started as a nonprofit to actually be able to stand up for people, for humanity, and create an artificial general intelligence that was both competitive to Google and was available. And about a billion dollars was invested into it. But in 2019, they saw their transformer models were really starting to do something special. And that's when Microsoft came in with another billion and started seeing this as are we continue to be nonprofit? Because remember at this stage, that's about four years into the business, right where Fathom is now. There's no profitability, and as a nonprofit, it sort of implied that they were more of a research arm, more of something good for humanity, which is one of the reasons Musk has tried to sue them, and other people are sort of upset. How do you actually make that transition? Well, they've already done it with the loading of money, billions, from Microsoft in the upcoming years. And as ChatGPT came out, you've all seen it. This is getting bigger and bigger, but the key is, as Fathom grew, its model was based on $150 transcription cost going to nothing by AI. Very simple, right? Well, all the AGI companies see this huge training cost. Almost all the investment goes towards the training cost and the heavily expensive engineering talent that's being incredibly competitively paid. So you got expensive engineers and an increase in compute cost that isn't going down. And you have people like Microsoft having to run electricity off of three mile nuclear plan. And you see like, that's a lot of difference. And we haven't even touched on what are they really gonna do with content? How are they gonna make this thing smarter? So if their investment strategy really is create this big moat of AGI, how possible is that when you have tens of billions invested in other companies like Anthropic, XAI, Meta's investments, Google's investments, do you really think there's going to be one AGI to rule them all? Because that's what the gamble is. And is their technology so different and so proprietary? Because the data training is what matters so much, which ties into what synthetic data and the promise of that is to actually make this thing scale. Meta through 15 billion at the metaverse for what? People without legs? Now they're throwing 15 billion at AI. And certainly each one of these companies is going to make an inroad, but is all this AGI needed? And that's why this thing is so crazy. And so many have even talked about open AI going bankrupt. It's not impossible. They didn't get the 6 billion they just got. They were burning 5 billion. They'd have been out of business. Certainly there's enough money to go around and the bubble will last a little longer. This one's supported by crazy billions. But the key is what are they really building? And do we really need seven different AGIs to change the way we live? And would that build the love that Richard White's Fathom gets from its customers? Or will it build a choice to go somewhere else? We'll have to see.
We have two AI companies, and what happens to them will shake the foundations of the AI industry. OpenAI's grand vision has two critical factors. It must lower compute costs and must be the undisputed leader in artificial general intelligence. It must create a moat. That's what they're betting on. That's where the billions come. But do moats even exist in the age of AI? Remember how Google search dominance seemed unassailable? Yet here we are. Is that an old model? This is a big Las Vegas bet going on. Fathom is a much clearer picture, isn't it? It's an acquisition target, if nothing else, has its own tech and a growing loyal customer base. And what we're looking at with OpenAI, it will have to have the same thing. It does have proprietary tech. Does it have a loyal growing customer base? It's certainly not an acquisition target. To succeed, it has to own the AGI space. That's what OpenAI's whole gamble is built on, predicting that future. And let's face it, that's the trillion dollar dream because that's what these companies are chasing. But is it even real? Fathom's approach of solving real problems, owning their tech, and fostering customer love is not just a safe bet. That's sort of what OpenAI at a much bigger level has to do. See, OpenAI is swinging for the fences, going for a home run. And Fathom is just doing the business model. And that's what's missing. And that's why this AI bubble doesn't really encourage business models. See, the AI race isn't just about who can build the biggest, baddest AI. It's about who can build a sustainable business in a landscape that's so shifting and there's so much money. And it's not just a U.S. Silicon Valley game. And that steady growth, that tortoise and that customer satisfaction, when this bubble bursts, that's going to be looking sexy again, not just for somebody as small as Fathom, but one of these big players to actually have the discipline, the approach, and move beyond the hype. And I want you to ask yourself, in five years, what company would you bet on still being here, still growing and making a difference? And is there really one AGI to rule us all? Because I can tell you one thing, Fathom has a much better chance of owning video, meetings, and analysis than this dream of GPT, which still isn't defined and is sort of nice, but where's the business model? Let that shape your perspective, especially you entrepreneurs out there.